Periodic functions are beautiful. From a ride on a Ferris wheel to the waves of an ocean, a brain, or sound, when we graph the cycle that repeats itself after every 360 degree rotation, we produce a sine wave. As we began to see in the previous lesson, trigonometry can allow us to merge the measurement of triangles into circles as we move into angles larger than 90 degrees. As a cycle repeats and then begins to go beyond 360 degrees, when we graph it, we can see that we have this wave-like pattern called the sine wave. A Ferris wheel is an example commonly used because you can see as time passes, we get on the Ferris wheel, we're going up to a certain height and then back down again, up to a certain height, back down again. Over the course of time, graphing a person's position on a Ferris wheel produces a periodic function more commonly known as the sine wave. There's some terminology that we need to know as we begin to look at sine waves. A period is the length of time it takes to complete one full cycle. So you can see on a graph here, if I start at this point, let's say this is a Ferris wheel, I'm gonna go down, I'm gonna go up to the top, I'm gonna go down, and here is where I would begin my next cycle. The easiest way is usually to go from the minimum to the minimum, or the maximum to the maximum, in order to get those values. You can see I've used blue to represent the period. We're going to consistently use the same colors throughout this unit to make it really easy to analyze the data. I chose red for the midline. It's not an asymptote. The reason I chose red is because I want a color to make it stand out clearly. The midline is the average distance between the maximum value and the minimum value. It's sometimes referred to as the median. It's the middle distance between our highest and lowest numbers. Finally, I'm going to represent the amplitude in green. The amplitude is the distance from the midline to the maximum or from the midline to the minimum. We're going to take a look at what the graph looks like and the first thing we're going to do is set our window. Now in degrees I want to go on the x-axis from 0 to 720. 360 times 2 is 720 so that's going to give me two full cycles and I'm going to set a scale of 45. So every 45 degrees there will be a tick mark. My y-axis I'm going to go from negative 2 to positive 2 with a scale of 1. Now, when we convert into radians, that does not change the y value. So the y value is going to be consistent for both degrees and radians. It is going to change the values on the x-axis. So I want you to think about what we did previously. How many radians is 720 degrees? How many radians is 45 degrees? Well, we know if 2 pi radians is 360 degrees, double that, 2 pi times 2 means that we're going to have 4 pi radians. And we know that 45 degrees is going to be pi divided into 4. 0 is going to stay consistent. Familiar with degrees, we're going to start in degree mode. And you can see that I've gone in here and set the window with those values. We're going to go into y equals and we're going to graph the sine of x. So we're going to produce that wave. Now you're going to notice we started at 0 and we went to 720. So on my graph I started at 0 and went to 720. Halfway between that is 360, so that's going to be this point here on the graph. And because our y-axis is set at a scale of 1, you can see that my maximum value is positive 1, my minimum value is negative 1. So I know halfway between 0 and 360 is going to be 180. I'm going to cross the x-axis at 180, and then again, halfway between 360 and 720, we're going to be coming through that x-axis. So we're going to plot some key points to get some benchmarks here. And then once we have those key maximum, minimum, and midline values plotted, we know that halfway between 0 and 180, this is going to be 90 degrees. Halfway between here and here, we can figure out what that value is going to be. So we can continue with our scale, and then we're going to just connect those dots in a wave-like beautiful shape. In terms of radians, we also know that 180 degrees is pi radians, 360 degrees is 2 pi radians. If we double 360 to get 720, we're doubling the radians to get 4 pi. If we have 180 to get 90, we have the radians to get pi by 2. And we would continue that along. So remember, this is going to be 6 pi divided by 2, which gives us 3. 8 pi divided by 2, which gives us 4. Now, I want you to see what happens when we change the mode. So I'm going to go into here and put in radians. I still have my graph of sine x. And now you're going to see something like that. So if you get that crazy heart-like pattern, check the mode because you're probably operating in the wrong mode. So now that I'm in radians, if I were to go into the window, and again, remember the y-axis isn't affected. It's that x-axis that's changed. So now instead of 0, well, 0 is still going to be 0. So now instead of 720 degrees, let's Let's try typing in 4 and then times pi. 
and you'll notice that it's going to multiply those values. And now instead of 45 degrees, let's try typing in pi divided by four. And then my graph should look the same as what it did originally. Now that I'm in radians, I've adjusted my scale accordingly. Okay, so we're now gonna go in here and see what the cosine graph looks like. So when I graph this one, we can see, and I kept the window the same, I kept my mode the same. You can either work in degrees or radians, but you're gonna notice now, right on the y-axis is the maximum. So with the cosine graph, when I go to graph this, there is my first point. And then we can see that our next maximum is going to occur here, halfway, so that's gonna be at 360, and then the next one is gonna occur at 720. So we're gonna get those benchmarks plotted there. All right, and then halfway between the maximums is a minimum. So halfway between zero and 360, I have a minimum at 180, and then halfway between the maximums, I have another minimum here. So halfway between these maximums, I have a minimum. And then halfway between the maximum and the minimum, we have to go through the midline, always. Halfway between the maximum and the minimum, we have to pass through that midline. So you're gonna get those points plotted on there. And then once you have those points connected in a smooth curve, and then we've got that graph. Okay, here's what you need to remember. I've changed back to degree mode. We can see that on a cosine graph before we perform any transformations, when cosine of x is zero, we're going to have a y value of one. And we know that's true because if we type in cosine of zero, we have a value of one. And so that becomes our y-intercept. If I type in the sine of zero, I'm going to get zero. So on the basic sine curve, we know that we are crossing that y-axis at the midline. Our basic cosine curve, we are crossing the y-axis at the maximum. You can also think of it this way. If this is like A and this is like Z, maximum to minimum in the alphabet, C comes before S, C is higher, on the scale. For our basic sine and cosine curve, before we apply any transformations, we can see that the period is 360 degrees or two pi radians. So from the maximum to the maximum, that's 360 degrees, or from the starting point, now notice I'm going up at the y-axis. So the next point I'm going up at is this 360, not right here, because here we're going down. My midline, the equation of the midline is y equals zero. We're crossing the y-axis at zero. My amplitude is one. From the midline up to here, that's a value of one. Or from the midline down to the minimum, that's a value of one. Take the absolute value. We are a distance of one unit from that midline. When you practice these today, you're going to, on your piece of paper, draw a really precise graph overlaying both the sine and cosine graphs on the same axes. Question number one is wanting to know what is the value of cosine x when the value of sine x is a maximum. Sine x is my black curve, so I'm going to look for it's a maximum right here when the x value is 90. So if I now take the cosine of 90, I can see that I get a value of zero. So when my sine graph is at a maximum, my cosine graph is going to be at zero there. And then the second one wants to know when is the value of cosine a minimum. So I'm gonna look at my blue graph and it's a minimum right here and it's a minimum right here at 180 and at 540. The next one wants to know what is the value of sine x when the value of cosine x is a maximum. So I'm going to look at my cosine graph. I'm going to see it's a maximum right here at zero. So I'm going to take the sine of zero and I can see that I'm also getting a zero for that sine graph. When is the value of a sine x a minimum? So I'm gonna look at my sine x. I'm gonna have a minimum here at 270 degrees. I'm also gonna have a minimum here at 630 degrees. We began this lesson with several examples of where you'll encounter sinusoidal waves throughout the course of a lifetime. One of those ways is in terms of your mental health. Dr. James Dobson, a psychologist, years ago published a book where he talked about the natural highs and lows of life. After you experience a high, there's a natural letdown physically as well as emotionally. And then when you get down here, there's a natural tendency to come up. So when you're examining what's going on in your day-to-day -day life, if you're really high and begin to expect you're going to come off of that high, it kind of braces you for what's to come. A lot of times after somebody's happiest moment, their wedding day, their graduation, 
constipation, etc. There is just a natural tendency for your body to physically come down from that. And when you're at your natural lows, you're also going to come back up again. Now, there are exceptions to this. If you're down here for several weeks, it's a good idea to talk to someone for depression and other things that can come into play. But generally speaking, this is how your emotions are going to operate. It is a cycle of ups and downs and ups and downs. And understanding that concept can really help you in your day-to-day -day life.